Hey everybody, Casey Curry here. Man, it's been a week. It's been a crazy week. We, uh, man, we're getting back. We're getting ready to go racing, and uh, I'm excited to be here on Driving Line, hanging out. Man, we just got a lot going on. It's it seems like every week uh, is busier and busier. So uh, I'm pretty excited this week, though. We're uh, we're gonna bring Aaron Coffin on here in a little bit. I met him a couple years ago. The guy is a wild man. Great fabricator. He's got an amazing shop show uh and just a lot going on so we'll uh we'll get him on here in a minute but man let's just give you a little brief of what's going on we um we're getting ready for vegas Torino in the trophy jeep uh we we're building two jt's right now in the shop uh been busting butt on them uh the guys at the shop are doing a killer job we are basically doing four inch lift 40 inch tires uh 60 in the front, 60 in the rear, uh, and just, I mean, we are going big. So uh, very similar to the builds I already have. Um, the difference is, is on this one, we're going to do our Curry Extreme 60s front and rear versus 9 inches. Uh, just doing something different. Uh, Want to keep it spicy. Uh, then the next JT build, uh, that one's for Molly. And then uh, the next one I got going on is for Monster Energy. And uh, we're going to do a super big one, and it's going to be actually a giveaway for Quick Trip. Very excited about working with them uh, and Monster Energy on doing a giveaway, and uh, it's it's pretty exciting. So does this work? This holy smokes! I, I hear you, man. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing. I'm doing pretty good. It sounds like they got you trapped in a box, though. Oh, <laughs> it, that, yeah. It sounds echoey for some reason, but hey, at least we got you on the phone now. Yeah, finally. How are things, man? Dude, life has been crazy. Um, working at Curry Enterprises now, doing a, a lot more here. Uh, not as much racing, obviously, with the the quarantine and being on lockdown. We're uh, we're yeah, it definitely it definitely <laughs> puts a damper on things. It's, it's affected the racing over here, that's for sure. But I'll I'll tell you this before we get going, I wanted to uh, give you one like no social media thing, just me to you. It's like so proud of you and big congratulations on bringing home the winning the car there, man. Just I I couldn't be more proud. Thank you so much, man. Thank you, thank you. It's uh it's definitely an accomplishment. So. I'm very excited. Yeah. I appreciate that. So thank you, man. So, dude, yeah. I, I want to get uh, – dude, I feel like your social media, I pay attention. You do a fantastic job, obviously, on everything you have going on, but we only get a tidbit on the old social media. So, I mean, what's going on in the life of Aaron? Oh, man. It's it's always a little bit of a mess. Like I tell people, you know, it's like we've got one, one foot in success and the other foot in abject failure. <laughs> and so we always just, it's always just a balancing act, you know. But uh, so we finally – I bought a building last year on the TV show. People had seen me in this great big building, and we were in that just kind of out of no choices. We, had, we needed a building in a certain time frame. And I was never going to be able to own it, and so I got my pennies and nickels, and I sold some race cars and stuff, and I was able to buy a building in the same town that I live in. But like as I think a lot of small business guys can relate to, it was and it was such a big operation buying the building that I really couldn't do much to it. It wasn't workable for a while, and so it took us most of uh, the last year to get into the building and make it workable. We've been jamming for about three months in here, and I absolutely love it. You know, it's uh, it's one of those things. That was, I was so frustrated so many times. I thought it was gonna it was gonna eat my lunch, and it was never gonna work. But you know, I had a good team and a lot of persistence, and we got through it. And, and so now we've got uh, Dean Carney's uh, 001, 002, his FD cars in here, helping him with his FD program, uh, doing a car, a uh, twin-turbo Ferrari for some guys in Canada, um, and then working on my uh, my junky old projects. So, I mean, that's that's kind of about it, just trying to, to get by and get through all this mess like we're all living in right now. But, you know, life's good. So now with the shop, like obviously I saw the new shop. I'm, I dig the, the way you did the glass front door, uh, the glass – garage door i mean you definitely gave us some style points there for sure but, hey thanks so I, I, you know i was it was such a big deal to me because i always had like buildings it was a place to keep all of my stuff in and i really wanted to be able to pull up in the morning and like be proud of it and like you know and i felt like you know if you can get to a point where your building is kind of it's the first impression someone's going to have of the type of work that you're doing not always but if you can and so i want people come up and just like within my finances go man that's pretty good that's pretty sharp that looks and we felt it was pretty indicative of of you know of what we strive to be and so it was a focus for us to have a at least a, a nice a, appearance building and then and make everything work on and then we kind of roll we dial it up as we had funds for it 
Yeah, no, for sure. Well, you did a good job. It looks excellent. So Thanks. Now, so now in the shop, are you guys? Are you still doing stuff for TV, or are you just back to the grind? No, we don't. We don't do. We don't do any television. And I'll tell you, as much as I enjoyed, and it's kind of a, you know, kind of a little bit of a uh, bittersweet kind of thing. But like doing all the the car show TV stuff, it was an it was an absolute hoot, and I, and I enjoyed all of. You know, it was stressful, but I liked the really high pressure you know, short time frame kind of stuff. It really forces you to be creative and come up with solutions very quickly, but you never get to spend enough time on any of the specific areas you want to. But I, I enjoyed all that. And we moved on and we did our show at our shop. You know, we, and we came out to hammers where I absolutely fell in love on the shifting gear show. And, and I've been fortunate enough to come back every year since I, I was out there with the scout. And so, but I went on to do this other show called uh, Aaron needs a job or AK needs a job. And that's where I came out and, and spent some time with y'all. And I had such a good time doing that. But as it turns out, the metrics for TV, just they, they didn't see what they wanted to see. And so we're in the wind. We don't do any more television right now. You know, it's all TV. We're just, we got a customer car in here, focus on, on racing. And, you know, and like I said, being that everybody's struggling with that these days, it's been kind of a, the funny thing about the racing over here is, as we know, we brought Dean's, uh, the Viper, the his only FD car, uh, only Viper FD car, brought it here to Texas and got into it. And if we had known that how long we were going to have it, we might have done more work on it because it was like, all right, we go, all right, we got a couple weeks, we're doing, or, or, now we've got a month, all right, let's do this. And then it just kept getting longer and longer and longer. And if we had known, we might have we now might have changed more things. So it's uh, it's definitely been an adventure this uh, 2020. So now, with that being said, like, so are you actually man helping prep and actually doing some racing stuff now then? Yeah, uh, yes. Yeah, as, as far as, like, you know, as far as pro-level stuff. So Dean's been running, uh, he's been r running uh, his the program here for almost 10 years. And, uh, and and we have here at our club, we have such confidence and such belief in Dean. And we felt like he, he just could use a little bit of the help that we could offer. And so we've, we've redone some things on the car, made the car lighter. And so John and myself and a uh, small crew will be out there at all the FD events, which is, uh, yeah, you know, we talked about racing, getting such a compressed schedule now. And so the tail end of this car, we're still trying to put together eight rounds. One thing I'm happy about is we've got two rounds here at home in Texas, so I, that's that's always awesome. nice near the shop. But, but yeah, so so we're working on that, and you know, like always, I'm just I'm trying to get in, in a car every chance, every opportunity I get. You know, granted, 2020 hasn't afforded a lot of them, <laughs> but early, but earlier this year I had such an amazing opportunity. So working with Cole and the guys at Life uh, up in up in Utah, the Sierra Car Program, it's like. You know, we ran, ran Pikes Peak or tried to run Pikes Peak last year, and then we're even though it's been pushed back, we're still running again this year. But they they do uh, Global Time Attack, and I was lucky enough they asked me if I wanted to come down and uh, and to to split a car uh, three a spec 350Z at Coda. Oh my God, I had so much fun down there, and so sadly it's the only racing I've got to do this year and it was uh, I think it was back in January but I just don't want to give a you know, definitely a big shout to you know cold all the guys at life and then the global time attack it was man it was wonderful the uh, the time attack th stuff looks like a really good time God I had so much fun and it's like and it's it's completely different than like going out door to door you know racing it's like the the thing I love so much is like when you when you're out there with another competitor is being able to Steam up ahead of you. It's the, you know, it's the you know the red mist, right? It's like you can you can run them down. Like you you know, it's like it, you have this motivation out there. And when you're out on the track, not necessarily by yourself, but you're not going door to door. You're not trying to outdrive the other driver. You're trying to put together the cleanest, tightest, fastest line out there. And so it's 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 fun in a different way. You're battling yourself in the clock, but it's it's really nice to get involved in the you know door to door brawls with other cars but yeah. it, i had a lot i had a lot of fun with the the uh, the time attack thing it was really neat just trying to chase down how tight you can make a lap yeah i i actually built a, a 67 camaro for the sema show and yeah uh, my goal was in 2020 to go out well i wanted to drive it on the hot rod power tour uh, but then I want to go do some autocross stuff like the Optima Challenge or something to go out and just be just like you said. I don't want to go out and destroy the car. It's an original body. It's got no Bondo, no rust, and I don't want to destroy it. But yep. I built it to go out and just like you said, I want to learn myself how to drive on 
you know, pavement and be able to go push the limits and see how fast I could drive my Camaro and learning the setup, the tire pressures, the spring rates, uh, and really just seeing how fast I can drive without, you know, without being slow. You know, that's where the hard part is yeah. on the asphalt is just like you can easily overdrive the car. And all of a sudden you're like, you're five tenths off the pace. Like you drove too hard in the corner, you pushed wide, and then you totally blew it on the next straightaway. Yep. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's a completely, it's such, it's a, a completely different, you know, everything, the different setup, different mindset, different approach to things. It, it's really interesting. And that's, that's one thing that I've, I felt so fortunate about that I've, I've enjoyed so much is being able to go race, whether it was Baja or King of the Hammers or do asphalt stuff or stage rally. It's like every one of these cars has a completely, is a, just a separate discipline and you kind of approach them all differently. And it's neat every time. I mean, I'm just floored every time I gain a new tool for the toolbox, you know, a new, a new driving instrument, Absolutely. you know, it's, and you go, Oh my God. And then you find all the other places that it applies. And, and, I, and I'll tell you, the one thing that I found is the deeper I, I get into the racing community, just the more that I, I, I love this group of people. I love what, you know, what people sacrifice and how they push and, and how they, and, and how they build race cars, how they develop race cars. And then on top of that, it's just the community of, I love being at the track, whether it's the middle of a lake bed or it's a big concrete paddock with air conditioning. Yeah. So. I, yeah. I agree on that. I, the crazy thing that I absolutely love is that, you know, when I show up to the hammers, it, you got that, that off-road type of person, but they're all the same, right? Everybody on the lake bed's got the same vibe. You know, everybody will help everybody and love the community. But then you go to some car events. For myself, you know, growing up in the Curry family with the, the muscle cars and the hot rods, you go to these hot rod shows or, you know, even autocross events with the vintage cars, and it's unbelievable the community of people and the amount of knowledge that so many people are willing to give, you know, that are totally different, right? They know nothing about off-road. But when it comes to get, yeah. opening up and just le lending a hand, everybody in the racing community, especially at those levels, dude, everyone's ready to help somebody out. Yeah, and that's and, and you know it's kind of it's kind of one of those things. It's like in the in the racing community, it's not. I think it's automotive community in general, but you can it can start to get a little divisive. But like ultimately in in racing, the thing that's so rad is like I I feel sometimes like there's this very sharp competitiveness. You know, obviously there has to be, but at the same time though, when you're in the pits or you're standing around the fire or you're trying to get a car together, it's like everybody's got the same hustle, got the same want to get it done, and it's like no matter what they believe or where they come from or what they think. It's like we got a car together. We got something we got to do together so we can go out there and, and break these things and have fun tomorrow. And so it's like we're all have, kind of have a, a common goal. And and people don't. I think that racing is a. I think is a good metaphor. We're all we're all in a big race to to get there first and do it best. But ultimately, we want to do it with all of our friends. Absolutely, I true believer in that. So I am a true believer. So now uh, on racing. I mean, out of all the races you've done so far, now we obviously know that you're you're racing a lot and various places what has been the most challenging race you've done man so it's like oh man it's it's <laughs> so it's so it's so different and, and i'll tell you i'll tell you my heart i love i love big nasty evil pavement cars but my heart is in racing in the dirt and it, it's like the i there is no way around uh -huh. I like I like the vehicles. I mean everything to span the you know the range from a class 11 car all the way to a full blown uh, unlimited trophy truck. It's like I love all of them for their just their own little differences. Now I I wouldn't want to spend as much time in some of them as some of the other <laughs> ones, but but I'll t I'll tell you. So it's I've. I've, I'm fascinated by it, and like uh, a couple years ago, two years ago, uh, a friend of mine and I, he he drove, and I co-drove in uh, the Three Bears 6100, and we just we had an epic of a time. It was wonderful. It was everything I wanted it to be, and and I we for our section we really did great, and even with a wounded truck. And so I was I was really happy to finally make it real. And I'd gone down, and I'd pitted and run separate Class One cars and prep cars for it, but go down and be in the truck was a, a, a completely different deal. But I'll tell you, being out at the hand it's like not last not this year but the year before last i ran a jimmy's uh chassis a mid-engine car we prepped it and then took it out there and i finished over time but i was the 29th finisher and i and like you know so dave sticks his head in the window and he goes what do you think i said you know it's everything i wanted from an off-road race in fact i'll tell you this 
So the first time I went up sledge in the dark, oh. it's like I get I get up the uh, so it was you know, on a last lap or whatever. And so get up the top of that thing, and Brian uh, Tilton was co-driving with me, and so he's getting in. I said, hey, you, you don't have to rush. Take your time. I said, I'm a little stressed out at the <laughs> moment, <laughs> you know. So it's kind of so when you say like, what's what's your favorite, you know, or like the the most difficult. Man, I love the challenge that Hammers put up because at one point it's like you're thinking go fast in the dirt, and then the other minute it's completely technical, and you could grenade different part of the truck than you could have in the lake bed a minute ago. You know, it's like you, you're driving like two different race cars and have to have two different mindsets as you go through it. You know, I really, really enjoy it. I love the logistical problems that Baja provides that your team has to be on the same page. Like you all, I mean, you really, really have to be dialed in on what's going on. And it's not, it doesn't happen in one little lake bed. It doesn't happen in one area. It's over the length of a peninsula. And so it's just, I love the trouble that the racetrack gives. That it doesn't, it doesn't care who you are. The most money or least amount of money, it is going to put up as much fight as it, as it can. And that's one thing I love about Baja. And I, and I have really fallen in love with the, the hammer style of racing, the ultra four style of racing. So that, that's, that's where my heart is. I love those things. But any chance I get to, I mean, great big slicks on you know on thousand horse it's like i'm in it's like i love it all and hopefully going to spend some more time in some sideways cars but uh for me this year getting back on the mountain with the sierra car and uh and really putting down a great time it's like last year uh during testing i was uh i was surprised at how fast i was able uh, just in the sector times to get the car up there and i didn't think i was pushing it very hard it's a it's a potent weapon and i'm happy to be back on the mountain again this year yeah that's awesome so do you do you have any plans for i mean i know we all have plans but i mean when things kind of open back up do you kind of got any plans to go racing to uh to part one more time all right like now with hopefully everything opening back up do you have plans to get back in any race cars for this year yeah you know so i said uh so pike's peak being being the big push for me for, for the end of the year is uh we're racing we're racing in september or so and that's my that's what I'm doing this big. And then I've really, I wouldn't say by any means, like taking a step back, but we've, we've taken on the responsibility of doing everything we can to, to help Dean have, yeah. have a car that is, that is together, that is prepped, is on the track, that he can focus on driving and doing the best that he can do. And we can handle all the logistics, all the team matters. And then, you know, making sure that his job is just putting the, you know, putting that car in P1. That's, that's what we're after this year. And then as much racing as I can get done, believe me, I'll, I'll be there. But, you know, we, we take our responsibility uh, seriously. And we really, we really want to see Dean on the podium. Yeah, that's cool. That, that's pretty, that's an amazing deal. The drift, uh, I don't know much about it. I mean, I'm friends with Vaughn Gittin, uh, but it's incredible how fast those cars go. Like, I don't, that's one thing that I don't feel that video does justice is like how fast they're going and how much car control they have backwards it's, into the corners. It's, yeah. It's, and it's, it's a rate and it's on a razor's edge. You know, it's like, so we're taking cars that are like for people that maybe don't understand exactly. These are nine second, uh, quarter mile cars or faster. And so most of them are producing power, regardless of what the power plant is in excess of a thousand horsepower. I mean, the, the motor in, in, uh, in Dean's Viper in 002 is, uh, it's produced as much as 1800 horse. So it's absolutely vicious. And so the thing is just controlling that sideways damn near on steering lock, you know, with another competitor inches in front of you at 93 miles an hour on a wheel speed of 180, you know, it's like, it's pretty intense. And I think anyone who's ever been to Irwindale and been anywhere near the wall, they, they don't, you don't need to explain to you understand just the, the, how, how high the, the bar is set, like how much violence is there. And just the cars are at full tilt, the drivers, everything is just is set to kill. Yeah. Oh, no, I agree. And Irwindale is where I watched it, and I was like, these dudes are nuts. Coming down the front straightaway when you drop down below, like, the start and finish line on the round track and then going back up into turn one, it is unbelievable how fast yep. they are going. Dude, it's nuts, and you ride with these guys, and it's like they make it look easy. And I think that's a – you know, I think a lot of people are kind of have a false sense of security. They look at it and they go, oh, you know, they're just sliding around. When it rains, I do that in my 240. <laughs> it's It's – it's different with a uh, you know with a car that's so hooked up that it's it's picking up the front tire, making a thousand horsepower. It's like things happen quickly. Yeah, nope, for sure, for sure. So now off racing, uh, what like over the years you built some pretty exotic and badass cars. What what is one of your favorite cars or off trucks or anything that you've built 
that's for you is something that you're pretty proud of. Man, it, there's a, a, a there's a couple things that I, I thought were were really interesting. And the TV the TV world is it, it's TV, and there's a lot of things that can be said about that. But it afforded me a couple opportunities to do things that that hadn't been done yet. And so, like when we did uh, we raced the um, uh, Roadkill guys, and we did we performed the very first Hellcat swap. And the people at Chrysler said that like what we were doing we couldn't do, and we were able to put this Hellcat in that dart. And and I thought. The first real hit off the off the trailer, uh, we had went we had gone six on uh, the you know eighth mile we had gone six sixteen riding the rev limiter all the way down the track and I'd gone five eighty something on the first real hit you know in this car and so I was really happy to to have the first successful swap there you know and it was a race car not necessarily a street car yeah. and then when we did the the EcoBoost swap in the Pantera. You know, that was challenging on a few different levels, and I was really happy to see it come out the other side, and what a pleasure to drive. That really, really worked out. So we, we had a few opportunities there, but I'll, I'll tell you, I'm a, I'm a simple guy. We built, we built a 68 uh, uh, Capri Sport roof. It was on coilovers and 20s and 22s, and it had a ZZ5 motor, and I thought it was so much fun. And then we built a little 3100, uh, uh, like a 48 Chevy pickup truck, and it was just, it was just a joy to drive, just a lot of fun. And that's the thing is, like, as much time as we spend in and around race cars, it's like I still love old motorcycles and old pickup trucks, and you know, it's not, it's not like oh, you get better, <laughs> you build faster cars, and you just gotta, you know, it's like you have to be building 4,000 horsepower Ferraris to get around. It's like I still love, you know, rattly ass junky old, uh, old hot rods, you know. <laughs> Yeah. So now, on, like on that, like just as like you know, I'm just a, just a car guy myself. But like asking, what is, as far as like okay, you got an old car, is your expertise like you know taking an engine that's not supposed to go in this car with not with this transmission and not with this converter and making it work, or is it body? Is it suspension? Well, you know that's it's a. I mean, I I think it's a that's a good question and you know i think that everybody ultimately kind of has to, uh, has to think about that you know i the way I, I i view myself is like always a student right i mean like you learn something every day every build we get better we learn something we always try and push ourselves forward but for me it's like i'm such a i like the mechanics and like the 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 kinetics of it the moving parts of the car so i'm, I'm obviously i'm a big suspension buff i love that but as far as like big uh powertrain and like doing swaps on it suspension it's like those are the things i really enjoy and it's like i like bending tin sometimes in sheep work but you're probably never going to catch me with a uh with a body file and a buck of bondo <laughs> you know that's just that's just not my I, i'm just not into yeah, it all. i like yeah. doing the sheet metal work underneath it but you know and it's like you know i like doing pretty much all the car except for you know, when it comes to paint and body it's just not my thing and, yeah. and like and I've, I've told some people recently like i love patina cars i really do but and people ask me about painting them and i say well I've yet to draw, have a paint job that made a car more fun to drive. I just have it. I mean, perhaps there's a paint job out there that makes a car more fun, <laughs> but I haven't had one. And and so I like the big motors, and I like – you know, it's like – and when I walk up on an attractive car, the first thing I do is look underneath it because I find so many times you'll see attractive cars really, you know – can be a pig wearing lipstick. You know, they're really good to look at, but you get up close, it's like, oh man, they're just this is the car that it that it shows itself to be. So I look under the car. If the car's clean and dialed and sharp and all the fab works nice, then I'll take a step back and go, if it looks nice, you go, this is a nice car. This is a good job. You know, and so I'm I'm really attracted to all the details, how you did pass throughs on the frame and how the you know, how the plumbing situation is, you know, all things like that. It's like what is what does it look like? How much thought went into this? That's generally what it what attracts me. And so I try I try and always elevate like my, my chassis game and it's like always trying to become a better welder and then just trying to learn more about what it is we do, what the new technology is, what the new boundaries are, and then and try and push those when we can, you know, when it's appropriate. Yeah. Now for sure. I, I'm the same way as you. Like, I, I love all the nitty-gritty stuff on the bottom. My biggest thing for me is I absolutely love having everything on the bottom side perfect, how I want it, all, everything, all the 10, you know, actually the 10 doing what it's supposed to be doing. If it's, you know, if yeah. it's under the wheel well, making sure that dirt's not going to collect on the backside or water won't get pushed into the wiring. Yeah, like, yeah. I well, you know, and, 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 I'll, and I'll tell you, I mean, it's like thinking like that. It's like outside of the joy, the the, uh, the joy and the stress and the, the love affair from racing, from being in the, you know, the, the man behind the wheel. 
But it's like, tell me that's not one of the most attractive things about race cars is that everything, all the hardcore stuff is on full display. And it's like, sure, we have aero and body work to can, you know, think about. But ultimately, like on an off-road race car, there's we don't deal with aero much. And so ultimately, it is just the mechanicals on full display. It's, it's right there in front of you, everything. So if the work, you don't get to cover it up with a fender or a body panel. The work has to be on. Yeah. I totally, totally agree. So, and, and, the, and, the, and the truth of the matter is you might be at 3 o'clock in the morning in a silt bed yanking this thing apart. So it's like it, everything needs to go <laughs> together well, come apart well, be well organized. And the idea is you don't want to have to take apart 15 different things to get to that one thing. So it's like – and that's the, one of the things I really enjoy is looking at a race car or even just like a street car is you look at it and go, oh – this guy, this guy's done this before. Look how they did that. See how he's got the room to turn that thing so we can get it out. And so you start noticing all these little details, like like orientation stuff, and why is that there? You're like, oh, they've had that. You can see the the progression. Like they've been building this style for a while. They know what the challenges are, and they've built it into the chassis. So it's like this car's easy to work on, and when they're easy to work on, it makes them easy to drive and put miles on. And I think it's a story that we hear all too often is that people spend so much money and like. For people that don't know, having a car built can cost a quarter million, three hundred. I mean, there's no there's no limit to it, but they're all they're very expensive. And but if they're hard to work on or hard to maintain, then they're not going to get any miles put on them. And it just seems like, you know, granted it's nice sculpture, but what a waste of money. You know, it's yeah. like if you're not putting miles on, what are you doing? Yeah. Uh, no. Um, well, obviously everything I drive is uh, driven hard. But that when I built my Camaro, like my, you know, this is my, obviously my first street car. When I built my Camaro, my whole thing is like. If I want to drift it in a parking lot, I want to. I don't want to have to do something different to my car. If I want to do bingo, parking- I mean that's 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 the deal. Is like yeah. it's your toy. You got a ton of money in it. Yeah. I want to do whatever I want to do with it right now, and I don't want to have to worry that's, about the repercussions. That's right. Like you, I hear about it. There's people out there that, and I get it. You get there's some beautiful cars out there that get babied, and I'm like, well. Not really my my cup of tea. I'm like, dude, here's where I'm at. I'm gonna put a wrap on it so that way I don't have to worry about the paint job. And uh, yeah. when I'm done with it, I'll put a, I'll put a pretty paint job on it and then I'll try to sell it. But for right now, I want to I want to drive it hard. And uh, just like you said, if if I need to look under the hood to make sure it's all there, I need to be able to look in there and know that every fitting is a certain style fitting. So if it's sweating, I know how to fix it. Yep. Uh, all those type of things are exactly what you said. Is I feel that underneath the car like in the the little things can make when you're on at the track and there's a problem being able to work on it is oh it's like 90 percent of the job when it comes to uh the track oh yeah especially especially if you're i mean if you're the track and it's like even even if it's a driver but it's like if it's a track car and so you're at the track you put in a day but you got a little maintenance to do man if you can knock your maintenance out be ready for oh. sunday and on to drinking beer before anyone else yes. that's winning that's at winning 100 <laughs> percent hundred percent and real quick uh we got basically we got some questions coming in i need to let everybody know if you got questions please let us know uh kyle's checking the uh the messages and uh letting us know actually kyle you said you got some right now yeah so uh devin on youtube wants to know as a fellow fort worth texan uh will you ever go out to moab or easter jeep safari in a kaufman built jeep Whoa, man! I'll t- so more, so Alyssa, I'll tell you, I've been desperate. I even thought maybe this was the year, but it's like much like my my projects, they keep stacking up. You know how they will. But anyway, to answer the question, yes, 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 yes. It's like I just there's only so many weekends between races and customer cars, and then obligations and attempting to be a normal human. It's so hard sometimes to get it all in the sca- uh, all in the calendar. Like a uh, year before last, we sat down and put every all the events we wanted to do on there. There were 91 <laughs> days of racing, and I was like, "Well, on top of it just being hard to get to the events, I don't know how we fund 91 yeah. days." And so, so yes, the the answer is yes. So I've got so so people may wonder about about the scout. So the scout we did on TV, I busted it all apart and had definitely had some just the choice components on it. And so what I've chosen to do with it is, uh, so I gave the the chassis and the body to uh, one of the guys who used to work, moment, yep. and and he's got it, and he's gonna and he's gonna set it up high on tons or something like that, Chevrolet drivetrain. But I've kept everything else, and I'm going to build a uh, a solid axle actual ultra four car, tube chassis, paneled race car, and so that so that I can start participating in more of these events without having to track down a car to borrow. 
And then the other thing is I've got this other truck named Larky that it's a 75 uh, F100 that it'll be on it'll be on tons and 40s. And so, but hopefully, yes, 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 I'll I'll be out there in the future. I can't say when I'd be afraid to, but ultimately. I'm all about wheeling and camping and hanging out. I just don't do much hanging out these days. It's like on the floor crawling around here at the shop. But to answer the question, God, I wish I could get on more trail rides. And then it's like Chris and Lauren going up to Arctic Circle up there. Oh, it's yeah. like, I don't know. Hey, did you, have you been on one of these yet? No, well, my dad actually went uh, with those yeah. guys. On the on the on the Alcan? Yeah, he uh, Kyle as well. They yeah, dude. Last minute, obviously, I got home from Picard. I was burnt out. Didn't I? Did I signed up for it? Was totally burnt out. Needed to be home. Needed to see the wife and kids. And uh, my dad's like, you know what? I'll go. And uh, dude, he had a freaking blast. Oh, to- I mean, man, total bucket list checked. Amazing experience. Uh, you know, I obviously the story is the only one that I know. I don't know if you've ever been in negative 40 degree weather. But... No, no. <laughs> I'm, hey, listen, hold on. I, I'm in I'm in Texas. No. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what's so wild is that, you know, we, we go out and oh, man, it's 30 degrees and it's cold and we got these seat heaters on. And my dad's like, it was 70 degrees colder than this. And it's like, that's I yeah, that doesn't you... make sense. So well, one of the crazy things, I was up in, it was during the summer, and I was coming out of Calgary, and I lost a fuel pump in, uh, in this little town called Sealy Lake, Montana, up in the mountains. Anyway, and I spent the night up there, and I was, we were working on the car trying to get it together before we realized, like, this, we just weren't, we needed parts we didn't have. And so I was, I was talking to these guys about, like, how cold it, like, oh, it gets cold up here. Like, how cold is cold? And I'm like, negative 50. Negative what? Negative 50. <laughs> they said, they said, they said, it'll get colder. They said, the thing is, you can't really tell the difference between like negative 70 and negative 40. It's like the difference is they said just how much faster your skin freezes. But they said, other than that, though, they said, it's all just painful. You know, I was like, can you stay up here, huh? And they're like, yeah, like, all right, cool. I'm going to head back yeah. to Texas. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty well. But yeah, that whole experience, uh, man, it's on my list now. Uh, like one of the crazy stories that I, you know, like obviously on a ran here is the fact that in the wintertime they use the rivers as roads. Oh, I know. Like, this is just everything about it. And I got, I, like I said, from being down here in the South, the whole idea of driving up a river, while it sounds really cool, I got to be honest, like part of the back of my brain says this is not a good idea. Oh, no, they send video. Oh, there's photos of a truck that went too early and it's ha- submerged halfway in the water. So it's not like it's. Kate. Hey, case in <laughs> case in point, <laughs> right? That's where it's like. So is it safe? Oh no, no, it's safe now. You're fine, but it's like it wasn't safe a week ago. It's like, well, how do you know when good is and bad? Yeah, yeah. nothing. It's like that doesn't that doesn't make <laughs> me feel any better. And it's like at that point, it's like I don't have any interest in like kind of cruising along. It's like my idea is to go so fast across it that if there's a hole, I skip across it. You know. What I mean? <laughs> Absolutely. So, well, I'll, I'll I'll tell you, man. I'm glad your dad got to go. But like, look at all Lauren's photos and everything, and talking to Chris about it. It's like I want to go so bad. And Chris was telling us about about some guys that would like, who would take build up a truck and take it up there and sell it to cover their cost of doing it. I thought it just what a genius move, you know. That is very clever. It's actually not a bad idea at all. So. so, but yeah, no, I thought it was cool. And to answer the question, absolutely. And I grant, I don't own any, I don't own any Jeeps and I'll be honest. Like I've, man, it's like, I look at them all the time, but I just, I just haven't gone that route, but I'm, I'm more of a full size invasion kind of guy. And uh, so it, you know, it definitely a lot of bent metal on those trucks. And so I'm, I'm kind of, I'm interested in coming out for that. And I really want to make a big weekend out of it, but we'll, we'll see what's in store for us next year. So, cool. all right. I got a random question for you. If you had to build one right now, would you build a 2020 Jeep Wrangler or a 2021 Ford Bronco? Man, so <laughs> any, anyone who knows anything about me knows that knows that I am a Ford guy. But I'll tell you, Ford has released next to no information about the truck. I've heard a bunch of th- pie-in-the-sky stuff. The truth of the matter is I don't know what to expect out of the Bronco. I know that the I know I know the Jeeps I know the Jeeps prove it and and that's that's all there is to it. And I gotta tell you, I am a big Gladiator fan. I think that the the box on the back of it is about three miles too long, <laughs> and so 
So it's like I think the back of the the back of a gladiator bobbed off. It makes a wonderful Jeep. And it's like if I was going to buy a Wrangler, I am I am still a two door guy. I really like the short little ones. To be honest, like uh, when I was down the last time I saw you at your shop, the black one that you had in there, I really thought that was about as close to perfection for a double duty uh, truck that you could ask for. I mean, I really thought that you couldn't get more bang for you know in one small package. You know, the actual reason I got that Jeep was I told one of my sponsors, look, if you help me buy the Jeep, I'll race it at King of the Hammers. <laughs> right on, man. So I actually built that in a way that, like, I went and bought a bolt-in roll cage. Dude, like, I did just your side. I went out and put a bolt-in roll cage. I, I went and took the plastic fuel cell or the, the stock fuel tank. I went and dumped it, cut the top out, went to Harmon Fuel Cell, said, hey, I need you to build me a bladder that sits in this tank. Oh, yeah, yeah, don't, yeah, yeah. I don't to make it legal, yeah. To make it legal, I need a bladder. Don't make it so it bulges up. I don't want to have to make or modify it any of the frame rail or the bottom of the body you make everything work so when i'm done i can rip that out of there put a stock tank back in it sure enough went and did that put skid plates on it and uh we dude the the two dude, I mean, amazing yeah let's oh i was i mean i was checking it out and i thought you know you could fabricate all kinds of stuff you could make the craziest stuff but it's like you could build something that would outperform it. There's no question there. But ultimately, it's like out of the box and with like bolt on stuff. It's like that thing's an absolute slayer. And that's that's one of the things that I do find so absolutely fascinating about, about the Jeep community. It's like while there's some bunk stuff out there, there is some seriously, I mean, just high tech, works well stuff. And, and to be honest, I think the prices on most of this kit stuff is really good. And I think it makes like really hardcore stuff you know, doable for most people. I totally agree. It's just like, you know, it's just like the UTV market. People go like, how would be, what would be the best way to go fast? I'm like, go buy a Can-Am and don't do anything to it. And you're going to go 90 miles an hour across three foot whoops. Oh, listen, hey, if I say maybe we'll take a second and talk about that. There's no (laughs) question, but I feel, I feel like I have to clear the air on the, on this, like on the, on the UTV thing. I was such an anti-UTV guy <laughs> for so long. And I'll tell you what, nothing to do with the UTV. I, I call them golf carts. No, no problem with the golf cart. Other than I thought it was like if you wanted to be – I mean if you had a credit card or a credit score and a pulse, you just roll in, buy one, and you go out and be a trail hero and you this 100%. and that. And I, and I thought before – before you had to earn it you had to go to the garage you had to buy the right stuff you had to put it to the right cocktail together spend those hours burn that rod you had to build something break it fix it figure it all out and then you could come trail riding with the homies now if you got a pulse and a credit score you're in and it it offended me right but then the more time i spent around them it's like you go these things are incredible they're not like okay they're incredible it's like the amount of money that we spend to do these with big cars is like it's so wild that we can get it done with these. But the, the harder that we keep pushing these UTVs, I have noticed one thing. They do the most amazing things. They just don't do them quite as long as the big cars yeah. do. It's like they take their punishment more directly. You know what oh, I mean? Yeah. It's, it, yeah, they wear out faster. But it's like you go get a bone stock one, and like you're mobbing at 85 miles an hour in this thing, and it's just like, oh, my God. They, uh, it is, it, what's scary about it is just like you said is, hi, I have no experience. Uh, I got 30 grand to spend and, uh, I've never been in the dirt and I can, you're telling me I put the green key in and it's the turbo key and I can go as fast as anybody else. And it's like, yeah, yeah, there's, and yeah, go ahead. I'll, t- I'll, I'll tell you, we pre-ran, uh, two years ago, we pre-ran the thousand and, uh, Brian, Brian Tilton had a, an X3 and it was largely stock, had a, had a cage in it. It had a cage in it, and uh, and and, so, and and we took it out, and like we were doing ninety something miles an hour across the lake bed on this thing. And my only complaint, the only complaint I could say is an easy fix, is like the the rear the the rear shock setup on it. It didn't like like high frequency, like you know, like uh, a you know, you get this, uh, that, yeah. So when you get like the little little bitty uh, bumps for just miles. But like big hits, it loved it. But the high frequency chop was just a little bit too much for it. But other than that, though, the car was wicked fast and it did well. And then this year at Hammers, it's like Can Am swept the podium. Oh yeah, they they, they killed it. But it's funny you say that because uh, first thing I do is always go get my suspension fine tuned. I gotta you know do our own valving in there, and it's incredible how good the cars are stock. Then you go out and put some springs on there and do a little fine tuning on the uh, on the yep. valving, and it's like. 
Holy moly, this that's thing kind, is that's kind of that's kind of that's kind of what I found is like they all come undersprung, and so like yep. once you get them sprung right and get them dialed in, it's like you're better than halfway there right out of the oh. box. And I'll tell you, we took two, we took brand new back one before speed was speed and Arctic Cat was tech strong oh, yeah. and like what a whatever that time frame was, we picked up and took two Arctic cats. I'm talking, didn't even have papers on the thing, took them to Mexico to pre-run, did two back-to-back 220-mile days. I'm telling you, and it's like one of the cars, the exhaust, you could almost see through it. It was running so hard. I mean, on the <laughs> rev limiter, the, the belts were in great shape. It's like we ended up blowing blowing through shocks on them. But ultimately, like I couldn't believe the amount of work that these little golf carts did. And, I, and I'll be straight up. When we took them, when we took them to Baja, and did do back-to-back days in them, and then we pre-ran hammers in it. I was a believer after that. You know, if you take them out and drive it through the mud, I mean, you know, a 90-model Ford Ranger will do that too. <laughs> so you go to hammers and you go to Baja with one, it's like it really it has an ability to change your opinion about it. Absolutely. I totally agree. Kyle, we got some more questions. Sorry, I don't want to cut you off. I just want to try to get as much no, as we can no, no, in, shoot. dude. We, I, we could ch- I could chat with you all day here. <laughs> uh, yeah, so – Joe Barrows on Facebook wants to know how did you get your start in off road racing? So uh, I mean, I'll t- uh, so my start in off road, it is, it's not, it's not wild, it's not beautiful, it's really simple, and it's about, it's, it's about networking and and just like being genuine, dude, with genuine people. Because so it's like this all started a long time ago. Built this little car, we took it up to to Detroit Autorama. Chip was walking around. Chip popped in the trailer. We talked to Chip. He goes, hey, guys, you ought to come do my show. I went down. We did overhaul. I met Shane Boulay. He was the fabricator on the show. And then me and Shane hit it off. We were we were friends and hung out. We had a great time while I was there. I did some other shows. I was in Barrett Jackson uh, hauling cars uh, for Richard and other guys. And uh, so I was just down for a week. He calls and says, hey, do you want to come pit the Laughlin race with me? And I said, absolutely. So I rented a car. I drove up to Laughlin, and Travis Coyne was driving um, Robbie's Y chassis truck, the old Red Bull yep. truck. And so I went up there, and I pitted with him for the weekend. And so they, on um, like on Friday night or something or whenever the, the practice night, they blew a transmission. And so the, the truck was drug back, and the plywood in the dirt there hopped in. And then so whoever the crew chief was at the time, he goes, who's this? Shane goes, he's with me. And he goes, he knows who's doing? Yeah, he's good. And that was it. Then one other question. So we changed the transmission, pulled the coolers, did all this work on this truck prepped it for the next you know for the battle in the morning in the in the dirt and it and for the first time in my life it all felt natural i was like this is where i want to be like it was like when i turned my hand to grab something the guy next to me had the tool we were all working on the same page like i just i was for the first time i go this is where i want to be this is where i want to spend my nights this is where i want to be in the morning before the sun comes up and just see a line of trophy trucks just sitting there huffing right as the sun breaks <laughs> and it's just and it got, it got my blood boiling my hair I, but now I got goosebumps. And so going up and pitting on uh, on, on Robbie's truck at Laughlin, who was my first experience in off-road, been a long-time fan of it. But, like, if you don't know how to get in, it's like you don't know how to get in this club, you know? And so Shane Shane invited me up, and uh, I'd known a guy, Roger, that used to work on his team. And, and so I got to go work on that truck, spend some time with these guys in the desert, and I said, you know what, this is this is for me. And, and like, I've never been able to focus on it. You know, here in Texas, it's not a, it's not very popular. And so we, do, we can't just run out of our back door and have thousands of acres. There is no BLM land. So it's always been a struggle for me to try and do more desert racing. And I absolutely adore it. And I, the thing I love so much is on a, on a pavement track, you get, you know, you have a thousand chances to make this corner perfect and the one after it and the one after it. But in off-road racing and King of the Hammers, maybe even worse than Baja, is that Every single car that goes through changes the track for the guy behind him. No matter how much pre-running you did on race day, you will be driving a different track. And the, and the track is indifferent, and it doesn't care how you feel, how much you prep, or how good your car is. It is going to try and take you down and your team at every turn. And I, I, love, I love it when it's stacked up that hard against you. I love the battle, and it makes victory that much sweeter. I, I agree, and I really do agree that I, I what blows me away, like – the story you said first meeting the coin family is your first opportunity to go to the racing. I mean, that is a phenomenal yep. family that has a heritage of offered racing. And then to meet them at the right time, doing the right thing of they had that Robbie Gordon truck and that truck yeah. is a, just like you said about pieces of art. I mean, that is a piece of art. 
So. And, and it was and it was like the first it was the first one of these trucks that I ever seen with this mentality, like with the wide chassis, how the links yep. were set up, where the motor was placed, you know, backwards. It was really I had not seen another truck like it, and so I felt like I felt like I just got hired on at NASA. You know, <laughs> it's it's like it, I it was it was just such a real pleasure to see a real race car up close in person for them to let me work on it, have the confidence in me to be able to not get in their way, to be able to make things happen. And like and I felt like I was like this is this is the place I want to be. These are the these are the people I want to hang out with. And you know, and so we spend every day since then trying trying to get back, trying to get there. And I found I found a lot of love in other racing communities. And like I just love the discipline, like the rally stuff. Stage, I'll tell you this: I have never come out of a car feeling more like King Kong than in <laughs> stage rally. It is in stage rally. It is every driving tool that you possibly have. It's like all of it is everything you can muster on it. And it's like I've only run stages or maybe. 16 or 17 miles or something like that and you get out of the car and it's just like unstoppable now granted some of the stages don't go your way but <laughs> some of them do you know and it's uh you know granted there's a hundred guys that could go faster but it's like in that moment if you were pushing as hard as you could and you know and all your timing was on and it all fit together it was just like this is the drug this is why i come back absolutely absolutely what do you got kyle so Andrew wants to know what it was like racing the Ford Falcon at Pikes Peak. Well, I'll tell you, I was so with the Falcon. I was so green. It's like, so, I mean, like I've told it a thousand times, I never thought I'd be allowed in a race car. I never thought I'd be allowed to touch one, let alone being in one and driving. And like, I really got to give it to the, the, the people that run uh, Pikes Peak. It's like they did such a great job of like, you know, they were interested in having me up there, but really – mindfully getting me through like right, what are you gonna go race call stuff that and like i went up there and did tire tests and practices with them and they didn't give me the go ahead to race the car until after the entire practice week and on friday night they said i said well good luck on sunday and i was so appreciative that that you know i tried to share with them my thought process where i was in this thing and like i had such a, a great time going up there there were a lot of off you know non-race car off the camera battles that had to be fought and then none of them need to be you know drug out here but it was a really 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 heavy thing for me to get there to have the car to be able to go race and it was and it was the realization it was the first time in my life where you have these big ticket items in your life like if i as people go if i could just do that my life would be complete like in those bucket list items you go, man, it's, it, that was the completion of one. I was overrun with emotion. And then when you're in the car, you know, I wasn't the, I didn't have the racing experience that I do now, but not much has changed. You know, you race as, as close up to your, you know, your potential as you can, but that mountain makes you be really honest with yourself about where you can go 100%, where you can go 40%, where you can go 75 because the alternative is not just bent sheet metal, it's going home in a wooden box. You know, and so there aren't a lot of tracks that have that have that level of risk associated with them. And so it was people go, do you get scared? And you don't get scared because you, you know, it's, it's what you have to do. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. You do your job in the car. There's time to get scared later. But, you know, you don't think about those things. But it is. And for anyone that's curious, it is my favorite racetrack. I just the mystique and the prestige and the history. It is the second oldest race in America, the highest hill climb. And it's like, and it's beautiful. There is no track more beautiful. Yeah. That, the crazy thing about, uh, funny story. My, one of my buddies uh, went up there named Bilko. He rides freestyle motocross. He spun. Yeah. He went out first early morning run at near the, like, it was only a couple miles in. Tires were still cold. And he, on the exit of the turn, it was moist. The, you know, the asphalt was moist. And, yep. dude, looped it out. But it looped. When he spun out, it it basically spun in a way that it spun in towards the mountain. Oh, not, listen! But, it was it was <laughs> it was la it was last year in a Porsche car. It was an RS one yes. car. Oh, you saw it? Yeah, uh, yeah. He was he was uh, uh, Travis's uh, yes. Travis's uh, on on Travis's team. Yeah. So I I talked to the guys about. It. I watched the in car from it. Oh, oh my god! <laughs> and uh, dude, it's because you're watching. You're like, oh no 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 no! Oh my god! <laughs> So. Oh, dude, it, what it, like just like you're saying though, it's not about spinning out and hitting some cones or maybe a wall. Like just in the wrong corner, if that happens, you're you, it's and it's like and it's like if you forget which corner it is, Oof. you're like, oh, this is the good one. This one opens, and then you get into it, and you're like, oh, so this was kind of a third tier <laughs> corner, not a fourth tier corner. <laughs> That's bad. You know? Oh God, it's bad. So, oh yeah, Kyle, what do we got? We got another one. Yeah. So. 
Peter wants to know, with doing the Aaron Needs a Job, was there ever a job that you wanted to try out but didn't actually ever get to do? Yeah, I mean, to be straight up, there are so many. It's like every time I did another segment, I just loved it more. And I was I, – like I said, I enjoyed my car TV because it's, it's all I think about. It's all I do. But it's like I adored doing these other jobs. And, and I'll tell you a funny thing. is like I'm mechanically inclined. I mean I see things like that way. But it's like I, the more of these things I went on, the more I loved and appreciated these jobs. And one thing that I was just so blown away with and I was so just profoundly proud of was that so many of these people, they loved their job. They weren't like, oh, no, it's an all right job. They're like, no, nah, I'm a second generation, whatever this is. I don't really see myself doing anything else. Like I love this. And, and I think that you know, it's like in social media and on television and stuff like that, we glorify so many, so many jobs that really aren't what most people do, you know, and quite frankly, some of mine just be fictitious, but these people were getting up and making a difference in my life and your life and the, everyone who's listening right now. And like, and no one thanks them. Nobody puts, you know, Instagram pages up dedicated to the job that they do, but it was, it's in, it's important. They love it. And I love doing it. You felt like at the end of the day, when you got done, like I did something today, like I made something happen. And I think that that's one that, you know, we talk about people's mental health or emotional health. I think that's one thing that like, car builders it's like there are struggles or tons of struggles we have but the one thing that i think patches and bridges it all is like before you hit the lights you crack a beer and you're looking at a project you're working on you say i did that today you look at it and you know i could have done this i could have done this i chose this you can see the body of your work in front of you and you know it's going to be fun you know it's like that, that it's it's not like you change the world for somebody but what it is is like i can't wait to find out how well that works you know what i mean and so it's like you get done at the end of your day, and then someone goes, well, how was your day? It was pretty damn good. I made stuff today. <laughs> oh, dude, absolutely. I, dude, it's such a cool experience. Like, just... But, but to, to, answer that, to answer this question, though, is there were so many jobs. I was so floored. I like working in the Hoover Dam, and it, it was, golly, I had a great time. But I'll tell you this. And when I was in uh, Palm Springs working on the aerial tramway, a, the guys I everything I did, the guys I worked with were incredible. But these guys, man, I just clicked with and had a damn good time. And so it was six o'clock in the morning. I'm a hundred foot over the rocks, eight thousand feet up off the valley floor, Yo. standing on a th standing on a three inch I beam, hanging rigging to winch a cable out. <laughs> and I was just like, you guys get paid for this, you know? And it's uh. it's like. Now, granted, every – and one thing I realize is every job turns into a job at some point. Yep. But it's like I had such a good time learning about what their processes are and what they do. And it's like – and the other thing is I love being outdoor, and I'm also a big fan of – you know, I know it's not politically correct, and I don't care. But the thing is like I like big, heavy man work, you know, and it's like I like doing stuff, and you're like, dude, that was some serious shit. And so like, that's what I, I really enjoy that. So anytime like big – heavy grunty stuff gets done i'm a fan and it's like that verge of being dangerous at all times yeah that's it that's <laughs> it if, if, if risk is part of the job uh, i'm signing you up uh totally dude i'm in the same way well dude aaron we've been on here an hour uh, uh dude i want to uh keep chatting but dude we we gotta we're gonna have to do this again yeah, like any, any time, man. I'm, I'm, I'm always, uh, always down. We can do, we can do an after hours with a case of beer. Absolutely. Well, dude, Aaron, I appreciate it. Driving line appreciates it. Nitto Tire, we all appreciate everything you do for the sport as a whole. Everything from all the car builds, the racing, the off road, the on road. We're, we're all, we're all big fans. So thank you so much for joining us today. Hey, hey, likewise. Hey, let's get a truck to let's do Alcan, man. Dude, absolutely. 2021 Alcan. I will. Uh, Hopefully Chris is watching, and if hey, not, we'll let Chris, him know. Chris, Chris and Kristen, guess what? We're coming to Alcan. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you very much, and uh, everyone on Driving Line, we will see you guys very soon. Still on? You there? Yep. Yeah, well, we're all back. Oh, in, ca in case you didn't hear me, I just wanted a uh, big goodbye and 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 uh, to everybody listening. And uh, I just want to say thanks again for the opportunity. Let's do it again sometime. And uh, can't wait to spend some time on the show, Casey. Absolutely, we'll talk to you real soon. All right, see you, brother. All right, bye. bye.